thrilled to be here. I am uh, extra thrilled because of the weather from where I'm from. Um, thank you, Lori uh, and Dennis, for your welcome um, and friendship over the years. Uh, and to Esther and Veronica and all at Ulight and Locust Projects for your generosity and organization. And hello and thank you and welcome to some of my museum friends that have joined us in the audience tonight. Um, thank you so much for being here and especially um, Suzanne and Nancy um, Loyal Skidmore team. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, it is especially uh, wonderful to be here uh, in your beautiful Miami. I, from where I live in upstate New York in Saratoga Springs, uh, it is extra special to be here at this time of the year when sunny days are very few at home. Um, it doesn't look like this picture right now, um, but there's anticipation and hope in the air. Spring is coming. Um, it's an honor to be here to share news from the Tang Teaching Museum at Skidmore College. Um, I am thrilled to be speaking with artists tonight uh, to learn more about what artists are making here in this city especially to visit with several um, artists this week uh, during studio visits, um, learning about their ideas being in their studios uh, and with their artwork. Uh, these are the kind of moments that inspired me to become a curator, uh, and it's a privilege to be led into uh, your spaces, and I look forward to seeing more artists tomorrow. So tonight I have a report from the Tang Museum for you. Uh, with a focus on values and how those values affect the choice of artists, uh, how we experiment with exhibition making, and why we focus on artists and students. Um, and then maybe we can talk a bit together uh, out in the lobby. Um, so what does it look like to be a museum of yes? The idea of a museum of yes is what guides us at the Tang. It sets the tone and creates a place from which great things can happen. Everything we do is developed with a point of view and a mission. How can we make museums the central place of convening in our communities? The history of public museums is relatively short, and that history comes from a place of limited access a sharing of knowledge and experience with relatively few. That is changing. And the Tang is a museum fueled by, more by ideas than objects as a place for dialogue and exchange with an expanding public. A place to experience new and unusual things, eccentric displays and pedagogies, alternatives to the dominant norms. We strive to make collecting and exhibition decisions based on values that take into account our place, and most importantly, the specific opportunities we have in college and university museums to affect change. In college museums, we're given one of the most critical platforms to be radical and to be proactive, to be an experimental laboratory space grounded in academic freedom and based in teaching and learning. This is sadly a freedom not always shared by our larger civic museum peers. Based in service to uncommon artists, student audiences, and diverse communities who look to us to experience unusual and new things, we can propose new ways of thinking and therefore new ways of acting. There are, very few, there are few things more important than taking time with our neighbors and future generations and welcoming them into new knowledge, new histories, and new ways of speaking and being. Thank you, Lori, for mentioning the library. We often cite the library, the studio, the laboratory, as spaces that we strive to be like in the, in the galleries of the museum. So what does it look like to be a museum of yes? Um, we start with the premise that our museum is a space for experimentation. Um, a place for formal play with great art and inventive design, and for the interrogation of history and power with objects and architecture. This is a picture of an exhibition, I Was a Double, 
for this show, we invited Pulitzer Prize winning composer David Lang to co-curate a project that combined the words of artists set to music within a wide open gallery. This is our Wachenheim Gallery, the downstairs gallery of the Tang Museum. We recorded the new composition with fantastic singers, my first time uh, signing up, a, finding a recording studio in New York, and the piece was engineered to move around the space, sometimes a single voice in isolation, sometimes in full unison. You can see the speakers hanging from the ceiling. There's one speaker for each of the artworks, and the artist's voice is being sung through those speakers. So there's a speaker over that Alfred Jensen painting on the right. There's a speaker over the Fred Tomaselli. Uh, the furniture is made for the space by Chris Johansson and Johanna Jackson. A speaker for Christopher Wool, a speaker for Gabriel Orozco. More furniture. The space allowed us, uh, was built in a way that allowed for many performances. Um, and you can see we like filling up the room. We like people. We like engagement, activity, dialogue in all forms. So we commissioned the new music. This is Ashley Bathgate on the right. Fantastic cellist, the lead cellist in Bang on a Can, which is a fantastic music group based in New York, um, who came, who happens to be from Saratoga Springs. Bonus material. Um, and they're playing behind in front of a K. Rosen wall work. Um, he's playing the cello with his hands while she's doubling his part uh, with computers. So percussion um, debuted a new piece in our space with new instruments. And if you can tell, they're playing with pencils. Um, they're in front of a massive painting by uh, Chris Martin. And in the corner there, a uh, two-part work by Karen Davies. Many of the works that you're seeing in this show were from our collection. And um, we rarely say these were the shows are collection shows. Because we, as I said, we start with ideas first. And that doesn't mean that we don't love and care and, and honor our collection every day. But it means that we start with um, the, the good parts of why those works were made and the possibilities for what those works can catalyze. This is another example. Um, similarly, a collaboration. Um, we like to curate in collaboration. Um, the collaboration was an invitation to sculptor Jessica Stockholder to curate and co-curate with me an exhibition about abstraction. Um, it came from conversations that we were having socially and in her studio uh, that turned into an expansive installation with works of art and design from um, mostly started about half from our collection and then borrowed. So uh, the intent was uh, a response um, from me hearing her in her studio to think about a way for her to operate uh, differently than she had been asked to before by many museums. Um, and the idea of curating a show was new to her. She had not done that before. The idea of passing judgment from her point of view or making choices about other artists was very provocative. Um, and in the end, as you can see in the foreground, she did insert some Jessica Stockholder-like sculpture, which we are very, very happy to have. This is uh, that same show called The Jewel Thief. Uh, the s chandeliers by Virgil Markey from Philadelphia. Um, the cube is um, a, a space for a site-specific work by Elena Herzog. And the woman there is looking at a piece by Polly Applebaum hanging on a work by Elena Herzog. Stefan Dean, um, which was on top of a work by Richard Woods, which was on top of a cube painted by Jim Hodges. And the, uh, um, as you can see, um, or as you can, I think you can see from that perspective, you couldn't see the Stefan Dean if you were standing on the floor. You had to see it from the second floor. So part of the show was, uh, part of Jessica's provocation was to use the architecture and to use space and levels in an interesting way. Cherry Levine, um, a 
photograph of a Dorothy Daner sculpture, which we installed outside on the other side of that wall. <coughs> so that was a, a way to have a hole in the wall when we couldn't cut a hole in our wall. Um, and Charles Long. And you can see a little bit better some scale here about the, um, how, how uh, interesting and, and enveloping the space was. So these are four of the artists in the exhibition um, talking. Um, and we had many, many discussions and talks about the work in the show. And the last example of this kind of work that I'm going to show you is an exhibition called Affinity Atlas, which was an exhibition um, made uh, in honor of our 15th anniversary. The Tang Museum opened in 2000. We are 18 years old. We're getting ready for our 20th anniversary, which we're very excited about. Um, and Affinity Atlas was a show uh, based on Abby Warburg's 1920s cataloging project of uh, his, his attempt at an immense visual history of the world. Um, and we brought together work in a cabinet of curiosities like style um, that hopefully brought out some new ways of thinking about these artists and these works. Uh, you saw one picture of it earlier um, um, when I was talking about the museum. Um, Nick Cave sound suit, Paul Tech in the, in the foreground. These are works that are David Diao, if you could see the detail, that green painting is by David Diao and it's a um, uh, uh, a reproduction of Alfred Barr's diagram of modern art. So the idea of organizing our world, our visual wor world, um, was being challenged uh, in this exhibition. Works by Nicole Cherubini, um, the back of a work by Jeffrey Gibson, Lenore Tawney is the woven work, um, Phyllis Galembo, Myron Stout painting, um, African pottery, uh, uh, Southwest Rug, another Charles Long work. Um, we're hoping that through these provocations and pushing together works that are rarely seen together or rarely, uh, or certainly were made in different contexts for different reasons, that we're finding new possibilities and engaging them uh, in new ways. How can the museum be a platform for speech? a place of convening, a place for people, a place for dialogue and provocation. Um, this is a picture of a piece by Mel Ziegler called Flag Exchange. Um, uh, this is a, a, a project that we helped um, the artist, he's from Nashville, um, finish, complete. Um, he had begun the work, we found out about that and asked him if he could uh, work with us to finish the work uh, for the last presidential election cycle. And what it is is a, a frayed flag, a tattered American flag uh, from each of the states of the United States of America. He would go to each state, travel around, look for a, 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 a frayed American flag on view somewhere, found, find who owned it, make a connection and ask if they would exchange that flag for a new one that he had in the trunk of his car. Um, and he did that over many years. Uh, and then these are all the flags in state order. Um, so the piece was in the ceiling. And then that created a stage and a convening spot, a town hall uh, on the first floor, on the, on the, on the floor, uh, which allowed for um, dozens and dozens of really intense, intense uh, programming to happen during the election. All different kinds of things, all different points of view, leading up to, leading, well, not ending, but leading up to a, a very, very intense uh, election night, um, party slash non-party for whoever was in the audience. Um, but for a lot of the students, it was a real Shocker! It was a, you know we're at an undergraduate college, and this is the first time this cohort is voting, um, and it was a great night to have everyone together to talk about it, to talk about what happened, and then um, a pop-up course was created the next day, 
and we had a two-week class that convened um, in the space uh, for um, deciding what to do next. Um, having a space where uh, dialogue is happening catalyzed by art, we find to be a really winning combination. And um, making the space open for all different kinds of making, um, it takes a lot of energy to invite everyone. Not everyone necessarily you know, immediately walks in on their own. A uh, good part of what the Tang staff does is be great ambassadors for the museum on campus and um, specifically and strategically work to get different kinds of people into the museum. Students who are involved in, in certain groups or certain majors or areas of study, faculty who are doing research that we're interested in, and inviting them in. This is, uh, we acquired the archive of Stephen Lieber, who was an ephemera dealer in San Francisco who died, and uh, part of that uh, collection involves a lot of artist books, comic books, zines, and that um, allowed for a year of zine making um, organized entirely by students in reaction to sorting through those artist books, mostly from the 60s and 70s. So how could they make their own based on their issues? We started a radio station, um, a very tiny, tiny radio station that barely makes it to the parking lot, but um, it is uh, the, the uh, impact of, of inviting students to program their own radio station is, has had uh, fantastic, fantastic appeal and has allowed for a lot of new students who come into the museum. Um, uh, that's pretty much how you hear the radio station down there. And that's pretty much our only sign for the radio station. Um, and it's only on a few days. Um, but when it is, uh, it really only takes a folding table and some, you know, a, a suitcase full of equipment. And uh, a tremendous group of students uh, program all different kinds of music, speaking. Um, uh, they've now started being involved with some of the artists that are on view. So Kamal Patton, who's an artist from Chicago, has an exhibition on view uh, for two years at the museum. And every time he comes, uh, the radio station gets set up and they do a simulcast. So it's a fantastic um, connection to one of our artists now. Giving voice, um, you can see uh, the kinds of students that you're looking at in these pictures. It's a diverse group of students. Um, you know, young men, young women, people from different parts of the world, everyone coming together to share what they uh, are thinking about. This is a group of students talking with Wendy Ewald, really fantastic photographer, um, about her photo project in Israel. Um, the catalyst of her work and this exhibition of photographs from Israel created a phenomenal opportunity for us to bring together two sides and more than two sides, lots of sides of thoughts and experiences about that land. And um, this, I love this picture because this is a, a class where um, students at Skidmore, who had very different experiences on both sides of the wall in that place, um, got together to share their versions of how they read the images on the wall and how it meant something different to each of them. It was a fantastic experience. Um, we set up a classroom within the exhibition, and during the run of the show, uh, we had several different courses, I think it was eight classes at Skidmore, met regularly in the, uh, in the space. And you can see that there are uh, community members, this guy here on the left, mixed in with students. Um, and so the conversations are also intergenerational. And the ideas and the reactions and the responses and what it might mean um, uh, the politics, what the politics and the voting and the rhetoric might mean to people from different, uh, different ages and different historical experiences was shared and I think made the student experience even deeper. And for us at the museum, 
we, we lay the stage and hope that these wonderful things happen and hope that in our small way we're, we're adding to civic engagement and, and in a, hopefully, hopefully changing the world. This is the artist Guillermo Galindo. Um, so along with that project, which was about walls in a certain sense um, and things that divide us, um, we were thinking about other borders and other walls. And uh, Guillermo um, has been making um, sculpture and performance with objects that he gathers along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and we, he's holding up his, if you, can, um, if you can see that, that is a fantastically complicated music score that he created. And we had him come, uh, and you can see all of his instruments on the table, and perform uh, in front of that exhibition of photographs from Israel. Um, and it added and it added in such an important way about the topics that we were thinking about and how uh, what happens in one place it can be akin and can be helpful in thinking about discussions about others. Active engagement with collections and artists. How do we choose which artists we're going to ex uh, show? How do our choices about uh, who we exhibit, who we collect, show, reveal our positions, our points of view? How do our choices describe new ways to be, to act, supporting new ways of thinking, new ways of living? That was um, Terry Adkins. This is a survey of Terry Adkins' work. Um, choosing to work with artists and archives that are underknown or underrepresented. Using our space to open up art history and hopefully add new chapters to art history. One of the great freedoms we have in college and university museums is, as I said at the beginning, we're governed by this sense of research and academic freedom and academic uh, focus. Um, so many, as we know in this room, as, as all of you can probably name, uh, some of your favorite artists that aren't necessarily uh, show up in Gardner's art history. Um, and we now know, and we're learning more from our good museum peers all across the country about why and how some of those artists didn't make it into history. And one of the things that I think is a responsibility for us in museums and as curators is to look to those possibilities. Terry was a perfect example. Um, <coughs> an artist who is using historical research to influence new ways of seeing figures like John Brown and Bessie Smith and Beethoven and Jimi Hendrix, among many others, um, making abstract sculpture and collaborative performances, alter egos. Um, this was his first survey, and we were thrilled to use the invitation of the survey to help him um, archive his work and um, um, restore a few pieces and, and do a lot of oral history and research work with him. Um, sadly, he passed away very soon after the exhibition. Richard Pettibone, um, a retrospective of his work, early, a very early pop appro appropriationist, um, way ahead of his time before we used the word appropriation art. Um, he was making very small copies of of pop artists uh, and some of his favorite minimal artists in the 60s uh, and still goes on until the day today using Marcel Duchamp's uh, taking, he used to say, I take, I'm taking Marcel Duchamp at his word. You know, he, and, and he would literally uh, follow some of those statements. Um, he was an artist also that uh, was ripe for rediscovery for us a really provocative example of, of, of uh, how to live uh, an authentic artist life. Nancy Grossman, um, a unique figurative artist um, that added a new way of being feminist and making sculpture in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, these are her um, um, critically important um, head sculptures which are from the 60s and 70s. Um, we got a great group of them together as part of a, a career survey of her work. 
Um, these are wooden, carved wooden portrait heads um, w covered in sewn together black leather. Um, often misread as involved in S&M or um, other uh, sex practices. I asked her once why she made sculpture always with black leather over her figure, which she described as her self-portrait. And she said, because my real skin isn't tough enough, which I thought was just beautiful and, and crumbling. And, and when we were able to make exhibitions with artists like this and record these oral histories and get this work out, we can um, add to our, our understandings um, and even correct some misunderstandings. Sister Corita Kent, um, pop art printmaking nun from Los Angeles who made revolutionary and greatly influential work um, in the 60s and 70s. We have, uh, we embarked on a, a large retrospective that traveled the country of her work and in turn it created a, an important part of our collection. We now have almost 400 works by Corita Kent in our collection, um, which spurs on a lot of graphic, uh, uh, graphic design and activism and poster making and all kinds of projects, um, and really changes the way people think about what artwork by a nun might look like, which is an added bonus. Um, we like to invite artists in not only to speak about their work or with their work, but also to talk alongside us uh, about other artists. So this is um, Choctaw Cherokee artist Jeffrey Gibson um, with our professor Bernardo Rios and the student Lisa Moran spending the day with our collection of Corita, um, exploring influence, intergenerational dialogue, the long life of an artist, how new contexts for things we thought we were set and fixed can open up. Uh, Jeffrey described how important Corita was, and you can um, uh, see a video of that uh, on our website. Part of what we're engaged in now is adding new material and deep oral history and, and unusual reactions and responses to our collection and our exhibitions from a variety of thinkers so that when one comes to do some research on Corita, they might be hearing from an artist like Jeffrey Gibson, or maybe a professor like Bernardo Rios, or a student like Lisa. Um, and uh, we're, we're very, very interested in this kind of work, and I'll show you a little bit more of that in the, uh, as we go on. This is Professor Charles Luanga uh, performing with his class um, in front of um, Malian textile artist, Abdullah Kanate. Um, this is another way of responding to collections. We invite performance, we invite creative writing, we invite scientific papers, we invite <coughs> economic exposés, all different kinds of responses and reactions to things in our collection. This happened to be a great connection because Professor Luanga had a, a knowledge of of the traditions from which the Kanate came, and so was able to really work deeply with a group of students. It was a great connection. And so this is, this is the atrium of the museum. Um, every night looks like this at the Tang Museum. When you come, we give you a matching suit. And um, so uh, lastly, I wanna spend a little bit of time um, introducing you to something we're doing new. Um, it's called Accelerate. Um, this is the first, two, um, the first two volumes of the Accelerate journal. Um, Accelerate is a project that was um, started, started by our thinking about uh, race and identity. Um, the strategic plan of our college president had come out and we were thinking very carefully about the things that were in it. And we were listening to our faculty and students who were thinking about the racial makeup of our students, of our faculty, um, thinking critically about how that existed for us at Skidmore. And we approached the Mellon Foundation. They helped us with some funds to create a three-year project 
Um, we're in our third year right now. Um, to dive into the collection as a source for these new initiatives. Um, so it comes from our own thinking about responsibility. How are we responsible to our different audiences and museums? How can we be a museum of yes when the students are coming to us with issues they want to talk about publicly? Um, they feel like maybe we weren't being talked about enough in other circles. How can we as a museum help the college and the faculty and our community come together about these issues. Um, so the project built from that. Um, it supported academic research. It builds broader and more diverse museum audiences. It's bringing in new museum audiences, uh, commissioning new scholarship, and then publishing that. Um, publishing that so we can get the word out. How do we um, spread the word about teaching with new objects, new ways of thinking about our collections and our artists. Um, so we commission uh, writings from different professors and students and outside people like that Jeffrey Gibson visit. Um, this is our profess theater professor Eunice Ferrara um, on uh, teaching a black theater class. Um, where she had her students write monologues and different uh, theatrical works in relationship and reflection on works in our collection. This is a work by Fred Wilson. Uh, Amber Wiley, another uh, wonderful, wonderful professor um, uh, about teaching with Carrie Mae Weems. Um, and then the artist interview, which is maybe the most fun. Maybe it's the most fun because I'm the teacher of the class. Um, so the, the artist interview is a course now that we've repeated uh, three times and we will continue. Um, it's, it's a seminar that works with young art historians and, and other students from different disciplines about how to be an art historian when the artists are still alive. What is your role as an art historian? What questions do you ask? What archives and information are you interested in finding? How do you find that? Um, it's a seminar to create oral histories. It's a seminar to do original primary research. Um, so this are two students with the South African photographer Zameli Maholi. Um, the idea is that uh, every, after there a few weeks of learning about um, primary source research. Uh, two students every Friday, it's their turn to be um, on stage with a visiting artist. Um, and we've had fantastic artists coming and going. Um, each of them uh, has a it's, a, it's a big deal. We have a film crew and photographers and we are making um, really tremendous, uh, what we hope for are new uh, pieces of, of primary source that can be used for everyone. Um, they'll be available as videos and as written texts on our website. Um, so if you look up, in this case, Miguel Aragon um, or Angedeka Keneally Crosby, um, Michael Jew, um, that's his piece of the crane legs there uh, on the left, uh, Jamal Cyrus from Texas, um, you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to hear uh, their words, but hopefully in a uh, maybe a different way than some of their other previous published interviews, if they have those, um, where students are asking the questions and students are engaging them in the in the dialogue. Um, Larry Pittman, um, artist from Los Angeles, in front of his. Of epic painting from our collection it was uh, underwent a great uh, year of conservation, and he came out and described the conservation um, and the symbolism of the painting with our students. And we also were able to commission a new piece of dance to go along with uh, the painting from our dance department. So the Accelerate program is allowing us to drive a ton of intellectual research and activity in uh, making us truly, uh, in we hope, uh, a place that's adding to art history. Josh Fott, in our collection storage, which we use as classrooms. 
We keep as many things in, uh, as uh, uh, unpacked, unwrapped, open out of their crates so that there's browsing and that can happen in storage uh, and people can be in and out. This is Josh with his white gloves talking about um, uh, the conservation of his work. This is his work in the collection. Close examination. Hopefully our students will always be the ones that um, are looking closely when you see them in your museums in the future. Tim Davis, who surprised the students by bringing his guitar to the interview. And then the, the last thing I'll show you is um, our, uh, our, accelerate, our accelerator panel discussions. Um, part of the uh, grant allowed us to hire a curator at large. Um, that's Isolde Brolmeyer on the far left. And uh, she, her main public project is to moderate and, and convene um, conversations about urgent issues. Um, this one you're seeing is a conversation about memory and monuments. So things that are in the news, things that we're talking about, things that are uh, that we're uh, wrestling with as a community and as a society. So here she is with the um, director of exhibitions at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, Dan Borelli, artist Titus Kafar, and artist and um, public artist Karen Olivier. Um, it was a fantastic conversation. We convene these conversations uh, twice a semester. We've had 10 um, so far. Uh, you can see Titus's painting. We try to include people who have works in our collection. Um, this is um, Isolde with uh, Hassan Hajaj, the Moroccan artist. Uh, Richard Mos, um, photographer and documentary filmmaker, and Tanya Salvaratnam. And um, here they're talking about migration and borders, visible and invisible walls. Um, they're talking uh, in the middle of a student-organized exhibition. I'm not showing you too many of those. Um, we'd be here all night with all the pictures I'd love to show you. Um, but this is a student, um, and it, it's, it's worth noting as, a, as an aside, uh, student Hannah Traore, who um, we love to feature. She came to us with, as a senior with an idea for a senior thesis project on um, African fashion um, that turned into a sh looking at fashion photography that t well, turned into African portrait photography um, and which turned into her inspiring us to acquire several things for the collection to uh, support um, a, uh, an exhibition. Um, and uh, the related talk was that uh, Hassan Hajaj was one of the artists in the exhibition, so we had convened the talk during, during um, her exhibition. This is uh, Renee Cox on the left, fantastic Renee Cox. Um, Matthew Morrison, uh, assistant professor of recorded music at NYU, and Jessica Andrews. Uh, digital fashion editor for Teen Vogue. If you aren't reading Teen Vogue, you should be. There's a lot, there's a lot of good stuff happening in Teen Vogue these days. Um, and Azolda is a great at connecting people from different areas of our, of our world, from journalism, from fashion, from film, art world, um, and uh, these conversations because of that diversity of who's being invited. Um, add something that um, we find very inspiring. Um, and as you can see, it fills the room every time and we're, we, feel, we feel like we're doing something of really great value for the campus and for the community. And then in this visit, Renee also uh, got to speak, uh, was part of the artist interview class with two of our students. Not the easiest interview for those two students. We love Renee Cox. She's a, she will be invited back for sure. So we hope that by building a museum of yes, 
we can form a community in and around the museum. Forming a community is key. Um, who are the people in the museum? Are they coming back? Are they forming themselves around our museum? We're welcoming new people into the museum, maybe people who haven't or haven't thought of the museum as their home before, to build new audiences for art and support for artists, to help inspire more diverse speech, more active citizenship, and confidence and optimism for the future. I look forward to speaking with you more outside. Um, and I'm sure we have lots to talk about. Thank you for inviting me to Miami. If you're ever in Saratoga Springs, please visit us at the Tang Museum. Come in the summertime um, and we will show you around. Thank you very, very much.